This is a uh, talk about the building of the open paths. Uh, and in the uh, booklet, it says about VM ports, and we will tie those two threads together. Um, my name is Derek Collison. I work for VMware and the Cloud Services Division. We work for a public company, and these are forward-looking statements, so we get to look at an eye chart. So everyone read that as quickly as you possibly can. I'll nod like this, say I understand what you're talking about, and then uh, we'll get on to the fun stuff. So what is the open pass? What is even a pass? Um, it's a pretty exciting time in terms of a culmination of Ruby as a language and what it's done in cloud computing and Amazon and people like Heroku and Engine Yard and things like that have done some amazing stuff. There's a lot of different opinions on what even a PaaS is, platform as a service or an open PaaS. What we're talking about here is more about an application platform as a service. And what I mean by that is, is that it's an application delivery platform that favors choice and openness. And we're really gonna beat on that theme today. Um, I think everyone uh, at VMware and the team that I work with um, feels really strongly about how we wanna position ourselves going forward. Um, and I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say about uh, some of the choices we've made. What we wanna do though, um, very similar to what uh, was said uh, by Dave Thomas in the keynote, is you have the option to choose. DHH just said it just recently a little bit differently, but it's the same thing. You have the right to choose what you want to do. Um, and we're going to talk about that, like I said, a lot. So with all that, a, a what? A what is it? <laughs> what is an open pass? The application is a unit of currency. So instead of you getting into a position where you say, I've got my app running, it's running, it's a Rails 3 app, it's a Sinatra app, um, I'm ready to go, keep that thought process through the deployment cycle. Don't all of a sudden stop and go, oh, well, I've got to file a help desk, tisk, help desk ticket. Um, I've got to go and make sure I get the right server and the right version of Linux. It has the right security patches. And oh, I have to file a ticket to get the URL. And we've got to get the F5 going. And oh, that's right. We need a database. And we need to do this. It's the application. That's what you've been working on. That's what you've been sweating over. Um, application is what we're talking about. Everything else is decided for you. Everything. And you shouldn't care. You will, and we're going to talk about what that means, but you shouldn't care. So what makes it open? Um, and again, this is very, very opinionated on what you're about to see. Um, we think multi-framework. We don't see in our line of work a lot of enterprise houses or even generic customers of VMware that are very, very in tune with our virtualization products say, oh, don't worry about it. We're only a X shop. We have a lot that favor a lot of different frameworks, but might concentrate on one. We just don't see that. And again, I think a theme of this whole conference is favor choice and openness. So you want to run a Sinatra app? I love Sinatra. I'm a big fan of Blake's. Great. You want to run Rails? Of course. Spring. Spring is obviously something that um, VMware uh, owns and has a lot of interest in, especially in the Java enterprise uh, development community. Of course, why not? Node? Sure. Scala? I don't care. Python? Yep, I agree with DHH. It's kind of ugly, but sure, knock yourself out. Favor choice, multi-framework from day one. Um, I feel very, very strongly that you can't bolt this on. This has to be something that was written down on the original back of the napkin in the restaurant going, yeah, this would be really cool to build one of these things. Here's another one, and this one again is also going to be controversial, even within VMware. Multi-cloud. Um, there was a uh, PaaS meetup uh, that was sponsored uh, last night at 6 o'clock where we had people from Engine Yard and Heroku and uh, VMware was represented there. And we heard a lot from the audience talking about when the infrastructure as a service platform bleeds in to the effectiveness of the pass. And a lot of times, for example, like with Amazon, a lot of times all you can do is throw your hands up and say, yeah, that kind of sucked. They had a big hiccup and, well, yeah, we kind of look bad for it. We got a black eye. Nobody's going to be perfect. There is no such thing. 
But if you had the ability to say, oh, I didn't like what happened yesterday with my application. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to target my system over here and I'll deploy my app in about four seconds. And I have a flat line in terms of IOPS performance. We think that's important. We think it's not only important, it's something that you guys should want and demand. Working for VMware, it says Amazon? Yeah, Amazon. Choice. You should have choice. The other choice that we feel very strongly about is the services and the services ecosystem. And I think a lot of past providers have done an amazing job and I think we're just kind of following the lead there a little bit. There's some things that we're, we're potentially doing different, but you know, I like MySQL. Great, knock yourself out. Well, I like Postgres. Okay, great, knock yourself out. It's not our decision in terms of providing a past service to decide what you should do. We should help and we should guide, but I don't think we should choose for you. This is a, another quick eye chart, but when the slides actually come out, you can actually click through on these links and uh, see our CTO, Steve Herod, actually did a pretty good write-up on what VMware's uh, position on the open paths and talk specifically about our agreements with Salesforce and VMforce, which I'll talk a little bit about, and also Google. So. Wait, Derek, you're wrong. I want control. I used to be a server hugger. I'm, I'm old. I, I get it. Um, you know, I need to have things like I need to have access to the web server. You can't write the Nginx config as good as I can, or Ezra can, which everyone probably uses his stuff. Um, I need access to the app server, absolutely. I have to control everything. But relax. <laughs> this is a, a tweet that went by from uh, another um, colleague, uh, I always call him Dr. Chen, uh, Jerry Chen, who's, who's here. He says, relax, they got rid of the horizontal and vertical settings years ago. They don't exist on TVs anymore, and no one really cares anymore. But seriously, we understand we get it. We understand that we're living in a complex world. We understand that even though we want to do an open pass where the application is a unit of currency, and that's what you're dealing with, that's not the reality. We don't feel that that means that you have to compromise the purity of what you're trying to offer and convention over configuration. Um, so we get it, we understand. We have utility VMs, we have layer four connectivity. The interesting thing is, is that apps will bind to them and then they, the utility VMs, will bind to provision services. It's kind of a neat way to say, I'm stuck, I can't do X. For example, I wanna run a solar instance to do searching over uh, my database. If you look at those last two bullet, or the, the second to the last bullet points in terms of Apps will bind to them. Your app understands where it needs to go to get to the solar service that you're running on your own utility VM. They, the utility VMs, will bind to provision services. The solar instance understands how to get to the database, which is being totally controlled by your open paths installation, to say, when someone sticks something in here, I'm gonna pull it out, index it, and make sure it's all available. So we get it. Why do we care? Um, Cloud is about OpEx, not CapEx. Um, I was very fortunate enough uh, with some other people that uh, came over to VMware with me uh, to work at Google. And um, it was abundantly clear at Google, nobody cares about CapEx anymore. It's all about OpEx. What is your operating cost in terms of moving forward? PaaS reduces that. I think everyone in this room kind of agrees that at least that is the stated goal and I think there's offerings in the marketplace today that actually do that very, very well. A major portion of dollar spend is on the deployment and management of applications. So when we say we're switching from CapEx to OpEx, you really wanna say, well, what dominates the OpEx? There's lots of different answers there, but what we're seeing is a trend towards that is gonna dominate. You simplify that process dramatically. And what I mean by dramatically is, is Yes, it feels great that you can get your app launched in two weeks when it used to take a month. But what if it's like three seconds? Storage and computer trending towards zero. I think we all know that. And what that means, again, is it highlights that third bullet. Deployment and management of your applications will dominate your OpEx spend. 
PaaS is supposed to fix this problem. So PaaS is trying to fix the deployment and management lifecycle. Why else do we care? Well, speed and agility are really important these days, especially when you pull an all-nighter and you've got that app running and you go in the next day and you're like, okay, we're ready to go. And again, you get hit by that fun little wall sometimes of saying, well, great, file your ticket and, and we're gonna have this thing just ready to go in about two months, it's gonna be exciting. And you're just left demoralized. You're like, you've gotta be kidding me. What do you mean? I, I just spent eight hours last night and, and we're ready to go. All right, well, yeah, you're right. Well, we'll get it down to a, a couple weeks and we'll be out the door and it'll be great. It's not only frustrating, sometimes it actually hurts business. It hurts you even as an individual software developer of saying, I need to get going fast. Again, what if it was seconds for any type of app? And I've seen this before, and I, I just think it's, it's slowly gonna become what we all really envision is, what if the cloud is really your other computer? Um, and I think a lot of people represented in this room who actually work in the PaaS industry already do that. For example, uh, I, I know a lot of the guys at Heroku, they, you know, they use the cloud as, as they're testing and developing and, and going back and forth. And I see that a lot more in terms of even the people that uh, I work closely with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But for that to happen, a lot of different things have to fall into place because if it's not as easy and as fast as local development, it, it's really gonna not, uh, not fly. So in terms of what do we think is important? Reflecting back on the slide that said about favors, openness, and choice. Um, when we look at what's important is things like SLAs, multiple service providers. And what I mean by that is, is that I don't want to <coughs> undergo the hiccup that happens every couple days when I get a noisy neighbor problem. It might not be the PaaS provider's fault, it might not even be the infrastructure provider's per fault, potentially, it could be a hardware thing. I just want choice. I want to be able to pick and choose what I want to do without having to bend over and do unnatural acts to make that choice. I want everything I do to be exactly the same no matter where I'm actually trying to push my application. For me, this is one of my, uh, my pet peeves. Uh, a lot of my coworkers laugh and say, that, that, you know, I don't get it yet. And I say, well, one, either I'm wrong, which is, happens a lot, or, or two, it'll just take a little bit longer. But I, I call it the light bulb. And you, the light bulb? Yeah, the light bulb. And what I mean by that is that I remember about five or six months ago, I actually went into a, a Walmart and decided to radically up my CapEx spend on CFLs versus incandescent. Why? Well, I looked at my electric bill and I said, what the heck, you know, I, I, why am I spending all this money on these lights? OpEx versus CapEx. Every time, you know, about six, seven years ago, I was worried about what things would cost. I was always in computers talking about CapEx. How much is the server gonna cost? How much is this gonna cost? How much is this gonna cost? Google changed that a lot for me in terms of, even internally, Google was, okay, you're gonna have to, you know, pay this much for the computers up front. Then next week, it was like, well, pay us funny money, and then, but you gotta pay us a, a monthly rate. Then it was, how many resources do you want? There's this kind of weird bartering system and then pay us every month. And as we moved over to VMware, everybody that came into Google said, what is CapEx? I don't even know what you're talking about. All I know is, is I can get 100 computers and I just have to pay a monthly bill. So framework X versus framework Y, and it's like, what do you mean? Again, it's the light bulb. How much does it cost to actually do what you're trying to do? How much does it cost you to light the room? What if you could light the room for half the cost? What if lighting the room at half the cost was actually easy? If we get into an OpEx dominated world within cloud computing, all right, where everything is kind of trending towards zero, eventually you're gonna have a bill that says, my app is generating this and I pay this. And Economics 101 says either you make the top line go up or you make the bottom line go down. In cloud computing, if all of a sudden someone came to you and said, hey, guess what? I can have you light this room for a quarter of the cost. And it's not 30 bucks a month. Let's say instead of $5,000 a month, you can do it for $600 a month. For very, very large companies, eh, maybe 
I don't know, tough decision. Individuals, hey, that might be a really good thing. The point we're trying to make is, is that if the system that you're working on is not favoring openness and choice, you kind of lose out on that. So what is uh, VMforce? Um, VMforce is actually uh, VMware and Salesforce. It's an open pass instantiation that's at salesforce.com. Uh, Spring and Roof Frameworks, it uses salesforce.com data and services. It's hosted in their data centers, but it's essentially providing everything we're talking about. So how does one build one of these things? Again, last night at the, uh, the PAS meetup, we talked a lot about uh, the, these things aren't trivial. They're not, uh, you know, uh, two chef scripts that you run in your MacBook now can do this type of thing. Um, the way we actually did it is we have this concept of inner and outer shells, and they all ride on top of the infrastructure as a service. So IAS essentially gives you CPU, network, memory, disk, all those fun things, and they're all kind of looking like big blobs. The outer shell is the one that, for us, is actually going to do the creation and orchestration of the IAS. We have the concept of a stem cell VM, so we can clone these things almost instantaneously. And we shoot them a little message saying, hey, we want you to become one of these and they spin up very, very quickly. It's in charge of change management. So when the PaaS is running, it's gonna be, in our mind, it's a service. It's always in flux. It's always changing out from underneath of you. But that change can never affect an end user. You should never have a thing where I didn't touch my app and all of a sudden my app stopped. Why? So it's a critical, critical piece to our architecture of, of how that's gonna work. The inner shell is the, the piece that runs the core components. And in our verbiage and, and, and in others, you would see it too, we have this concept of routers and cloud controllers and execution agents and health managers and services. The basic premises of when, again, some of the first things you write on the back of the napkin, um, that you really just can't bolt this on, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, the whole system should be self-healing. You should be able to shoot anything in the foot, hand, leg, arm, anything except a, a kill shot, which is you, you just got, you know, a nuclear bomb dropped on you. The system should heal itself completely. It should be horizontally scalable at all levels. So those components that don't really mean anything yet until the next slide, like routers and cloud controllers and things like that, they all should be NY scalable. You should be able to run one, two, N, and you pick N to meet your needs should utilize distributed state. No single point of failure. You can't have a gunshot to the foot take the whole system out. This point brings in a lot of pieces. Favoring the service, or uh, favoring choice on a service provider goes to this bullet point right here. So if we actually want to make any type of statements about no single point of failure, we can't do it running on something that we don't know that they can also guarantee that. So the choice of saying, I want to layer my software on top of a PaaS that's layered on top of an IAS that's layered on a piece of hardware that has 16-way peering, four times, you know, power redundancy, X, Y, Z, needs to be a choice. Above all, it should be simple and dumb. This is one of my big tenets. Uh, distributed systems and cloud-based systems are complex inherently. Don't try to make them more complex. Uh, dumber as you get closer to the core. For us, messaging is a foundation. We use messaging for addressing component discovery and command and control. JSON is our preferred data format of exchange. Um, we don't have XML. I don't foresee us ever having XML. Um, HTTP or file systems for data transport. So as data components are being moved around the system, they're either a URI endpoint or there might be an optimization where a file system or another technology can actually make this uh, an easier transition. So app basics. For us, execution is start and stop, and that's it. And what I mean by that is that when we talk about multi-framework and supporting multi-framework from day one, the way we actually accomplish that is, is that by the time the execution agent gets one of these things, it sees a start button and a stop button, and that's it. It doesn't know if it's Rails, if it's Sinatra, if it's Node, if it's Spring, if it's Rue, if it's Grails. 
doesn't know, it doesn't care. It knows it has a start button, and when it's told to stop it, it has a stop button. Uh, be cloud ready. Now, this one's tough. Um, there's lots of different opinions on what cloud ready means. And I'll be frank, we don't even think we know exactly what we mean when we say it. But if you feel like you have to do unnatural acts and you're not doing stupid things, maybe that pass is, is not what you want. I don't think you should be told that if I know how to write my app, I know my QPS will be 10, I can do this all on a single MySQL database, I should be told, no, 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 you actually don't know what you're doing, you need something that will scale because you're going to be the next Twitter. When I come back and say, no, 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 this is an internal enterprise app, peak 10 QPS if, if we're lucky, my SQL is fine. I have active record, I, that's what I want to use. But you can't do dumb things. I can't do file read on slash home, slash Derek, slash stuff, slash whatever that runs on my, my laptop. That doesn't exist in the cloud. I can't do, you know, event machine start server on port 80. You don't own port 80. Don't worry about it. You know, everyone will be able to find you on port 80, but you don't own port 80. So simple things, but they are, they do exist. I just don't think if you're doing unnatural acts that that's necessarily the concept of what we mean by, by cloud ready. Here's another one. Uh, send us everything. And I mean everything. I don't understand what your app is supposed to do or how I'm supposed to create a start button unless you do. Bundler is good, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, is that Bundler is trying to solve many problems with version control and version skew and all this other stuff. But it's also trying to define a way to say, for you to run this app, this is all that you need. Bundle package is even better, though. Send us everything. How does that not suck? <laughs> Remember, local development, if it's worse than local development, no one's going to do it. So how does that not suck? We're, 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 we're stuck. Um, what the system, uh, which you guys are about to see in a second, um, does is you can send us everything. Um, and we'll actually do fine with that after about 15 minutes of downloading your 600 megs of whatever. Um, but more interestingly is, is you can actually send in a fingerprint of everything you are about to send us. And we can come back and tell you, great, have it, have it, need it, need it, have it, need it, have it, need it. And then you go, okay, great, then I'll just send you whatever I really need. What's interesting about that pool is, is that that pool is, is the fingerprinting is not only just a SHA-1, but it's a combination of a SHA-1 size. Um, and so it's actually shared globally within the whole pass. So if anyone has ever uploaded a Rails 3 gem, when you bundle everything together and you're like, oh, this is going to suck, all right, let's push it in, you don't have to send that to us. So we get the best of both worlds. You actually tell us everything you need to run your app, but we won't actually download very many things at all. This has been a big issue with us, and we've carefully watched Bundler both excel and trip and stumble a little bit in terms of trying to solve this problem. But it's a problem that has to be solved. I actually uh, get a kick out of following uh, Ryan and Node. And, and uh, I've been watching, uh, I think it's TJ, right, is one of the guys that does the NPM stuff. NPM has this magic of it's somewhere on your computer and we'll figure it out for you, but you don't need to really know about it. But when you actually go to take that app and deploy it somewhere else, yeah, you do. And so, you know, that's what Bundler, one of the things Bundler was trying to solve. And we, we think it's a valid problem because we want you to send us absolutely everything. It's kind of like the old days where you compile your, your C binary against a shared lib, send it to your buddy, and he doesn't have it, and it just doesn't run. Bigger problem, newer problem. It's got the cloud world around it, so it's actually cooler than it was you know, back in the day. But it's the same problem. So the tools. Um, Ruby, you know, the majority of this system is actually built in Ruby. Uh, we use a lot of event machine messaging, as we talked about in terms of a foundation. HTTP, you know, simple, basic stuff. JSON, uh, Rack, Sinatra, Thin, EM, HTTP, Request. So a lot of people, when we talk about this, say Ruby. Really? Ruby? You actually are doing systems level programming in Ruby? Ruby's a great language. 
it's very, very easy to understand. It's well designed. Um, a lot of the team feels comfortable in it. They can move very, very quickly. But more importantly, distributed systems architecture has little to do with language choice. I'm not saying it doesn't come into play, but it has very, very little to do with it. And if someone says so, it's hard to read that, but it says walk the other way. They don't know what they're talking about. But we all want faster Ruby. I do. I love actually going into 192 and we're following Rubinius and JRuby and all kinds of fun stuff. So I want everyone who's involved in that to keep pushing because it's, it's great for all of us. But again, with distributed systems, uh, if that's the first uh, recourse in terms of, oh, it's because Ruby is too slow, um, no. So some of the patterns, hopefully this rings true to a lot of every, you know, people in the audience in terms of how you would build a, a system that's supposed to do all of these kind of neat things. It's event driven, it's non-blocking, asynchronous, NY scalable. Um, make no assumptions. And what I mean by this, simple things like, oh, well you need to start A first, then you can start B, then you can start C. Systems should be able to come up in any order it wants. It should be able to self-heal itself uh, atomically without intervention. It should do all those type of things. So more on, okay, how we built this. Um, components are dynamically discoverable. They subscribe to, are you there? Anything that comes up publishes a, yep, hello, I'm here. So it doesn't matter which order these things come up in. Anything can happen. Never store central state. That becomes your single point of failure. And for us, health status and, and state is always available via HTTP. And so you'll see in a second with monitoring, I can walk into a system I've never seen before in my life, run one command which will discover every single component running in the system, comes back to me, it says what I am, what my version is, where my HTTP port is, and here's what you can get in information wise from me. So more on the components, uh, the routers. The routers are these uh, dynamic pieces that essentially bind a request that's coming to foo.vcloudlabs.com to your app, wherever that is. These have to run in real time. They have to be able to sustain 100K uh, per second, uh, changes per second. Remember, they can come up in any order. So you could have 100,000 apps in your cloud pads and you say, well, we're running out of bandwidth. I want to st start a new router. It's going to get 100,000 messages saying, I've got app foo, I've got app bar, I've got app baz, I've got all this other stuff. Cloud controllers are what you use to interface with the system. And this is going to be HTTP REST. We'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. They define the state of the world. They define the concept of users, apps, and services. Cloud controllers are special apps, so to speak, within the PaaS, op open PaaS. Um, but they actually talk to the end user through the routers, just like all the other apps. So again, simple and dumb. We're not making exceptions for our, our system app, so to speak. Droplets is a funny little thing we came up with in terms of what we were calling the apps early on. Uh, and the droplets and apps essentially is this massive execution field of, of virtual machines that had the ability to run your app. The cloud controllers actually will figure out where to put your app. And then of course your app will actually, when it starts itself up, the agent that's actually watching that the, the app is running correctly will bind it to the router. Remember when we talked about being dumb? Um, the cloud controllers actually figure out who to use by being really dumb. They have no assumptions about the state of all the execution agents whatsoever. Whenever you ask it to run an app, it actually says, I need help. It sends out a message. The message has a small signature on it, says this is the SHA-1 of the app, this is kind of the memory that we need, this is the other kind of tint, taints or flavors or something like that. And the execution agents come back and say, okay, I can help you, no problem. And the cloud controller says, great, thank you very much. Here's, here's a fingerprint of what I want you to run and go for it. What's interesting about being that dumb is that it actually does very, very interesting things that look smart. So if those execution agents are actually spread across local resources and remote resources, so hybrid type scenarios where you have some stuff that might be on-prem, some stuff might be off-prem, if you actually watch and visualize what happens, the system fills up the local resources first. 
and then it kind of bursts into the overflow capacity on the other machines. If you have two overflow capacity uh, reserves, so to speak, and one's latency is 70 milliseconds and the other one is 15 milliseconds, again, the visualization fills up everything locally, starts spilling over here, then starts spilling over here. Without us saying, oh, you have to be cognizant and aware that these guys are over here and they might be slower because they're further away. Just because we're being dumb. We always ask for, for help. We assume the first person to get back to us is the best fit for being able to do that. When we do certain things like, hey, we want to make sure that the app's not running next to itself, right? Because that's a bad thing. You don't want your app to have five instances all running the same VM. Again, the, the dumb part worked out really well, which is when you get the SHA-1 and it says, hey, I want you to run this app, here's a signature, it knows if it's running it, and if it is, it delays by some small amount the message that it sends back. So if there's anyone who's better fit to run it, they will. If no one is available, you will eventually respond and the cloud controller will pick you. Dumb is good. Concept of services. Apps these days don't exist in a vacuum, so they have the concept of services and you know, databases and key value stores and all kinds of fun stuff. The cloud controllers know about them and can provision them, and then they connect up to the application so that they can use them. And then there's a the concept of health. Not health of the system itself, but health of your apps. Um, what I talk about a lot is the cloud controllers are the king of the court. They say what is supposed to be. The health manager is the jester that runs around and makes sure that that's it. And if it's not, he jumps up and down and yells at the king, the cloud controller, and says, they're not doing what you told them to do. And the cloud controller says, oh, well, I'll tell them again. You're supposed to be running four instances of this, not three. But all those interactions happen in real time. So is any of this real, or is this just a really fun talk? Yeah, it is, it's real. This is a fun eye chart of showing the last diagram in more detail about what is real. Monitoring. Um, two things about distributed systems that I believe very, very strongly. One we've heard a lot about, the dumber the better. The other one is monitor everything. Figure out what to throw away later. We talked a little bit about this, so I'll go pretty quick. It has to be simple. Publish who's there. Everyone responds with a, I'm here, this is what I am, and this is my endpoint. You pull some results, then you ask again. I understand the push versus pull. I understand it uh, very, very well, and push models are obviously applicable in very, very large scale systems, so this could be a push some of those data to me. The point being is, is that a monitoring system, just as other parts of the system, shouldn't be able to make any assumptions. I shouldn't have to write a 45 line configuration file to deploy a monitoring system in one cloud versus another cloud. And that's currently what our monitoring system kind of looks like. And one of the pages. So what are the interfaces to the system? Currently we have two. We have a command line interface, which is a Ruby script, which uh, we're about to get friendly with here in a second. The other one is we have an STS, uh, which is the Spring version of Eclipse plugin that actually does a lot of these things for Spring and, and Grails developers um, who are near and dear to VMware's heart because of the, the, the relationship with the enterprises that we have. This is another eye chart, but this is essentially some of the things you can do with the system. You can push applications, you can start, stop, you can uh, create and bind services to your app, you can scale them up, you can scale them down. Uh, you can map and unmap different URLs. So vcloudlabs.com is one instantiation of this that um, is up. It's real. We're going to see it here in a second. And uh, some of the, the people from VMware are here, uh, and we're going to start taking invites, talking to people, and, and getting people on the system to actually uh, test it out. So if what you're looking at is interesting and you like it, um, either come find myself or Vadim or Ezra for more of a demo. And if you want to get on the system, see. Uh, Jerry or Deco or Killian uh, or Carmine, and uh, they're all up here in the front. Currently, vCloud Labs is on vCloud Express uh, with a partner of ours called Terramark. So all the boring stuff's kind of out of the way. Uh, do a demo. All right. <laughs> so this is the client. Oh, that wasn't good. 
that's not good either. Bundle. Oh, I know what I need to do. I'm sorry. All right. Now we're in business. Sorry about that. Uh, RBM is your friend, but sometimes it can bite you. Um, so I'm logged into vCloud Labs, and I can say info, and it actually sends you, it tells me this is how you're logged in, this is your memory usage, number of servers and apps you're allowed to use. I wrote down my little cheat, cheat sheet in terms of what I wanted to talk about. Um, this is real, so vcloudlabs.com. With our lovely network, it's about 99 milliseconds away. So we'll have to see how this uh, goes. So this is a real simple Sinatra app. It's kind of hard to see. Hold on. But essentially it says, hello, and it'll tell you where it's running. a little bit smaller so we can actually see what it's doing. So it said, oh, okay, I, I understand your, your uh, Sinatra application. Is this what you want me to do? I say yes. It uploads it. It's trying to start it. And it's running. So if I go now to foo.vcloudlabs.com, if I spell it right. So we got hello from the cloud via blah, blah, blah. Hello from RubyConf 2010. Lots of exclamation points. Update foo. Hello from RubyConf. Instances, scale up. We talked last night about it's really hard to understand when you want to scale up, but once you know you want to, how hard is it? So now all of a sudden we've got two of these guys running. That's kind of interesting. The network won't let me reload it fast enough. So as they're spinning themselves up, we've got more and more that are starting versus running versus all the way up. So to start up 100 instances of this, uh, I timed it the other night, takes about 10, 11 seconds. So they're all running now. I go all the way back to one. Network stinks. So back to one. So in terms of again talking about you know when you you've decided on your own you want to scale it up. Does the system help you do that? How fast is it? How fast can you scale up and down? Um, we talked last night about auto scalability is really, really good until you get the bill because your friend played a trick on you and ran Apache Bench all night long. Um, but once you've made the decision, you know, how hard is it to do that? Um, so for example, here's a Redis application. Uh, push, I'll call it R.
And these are all pretty small apps, so we'll, we'll see one that's a bit bigger here in just a second. So if I want to test, it says, nope, can't do that. That's because it doesn't have a service. So what services are available in the system? Currently we have Rabbit, MySQL database, and a Redis. Redis is the one I want. Create a service of Redis, and I'm going to bind it to my R app. Now all of a sudden we have Redis bound into the application. Now if I want to say, let's say Redis sample, um, I want to go down here and say require HMAC shell one. <coughs> Remember I talked about send us everything. We really do fundamentally believe that's what you need to do. But if you notice this app has nothing except itself. We do have system gems and things like that, that that form a default pattern on the system so that if you want to get started and you want to do hello world and you want to kind of push things around and uh, I think we have 30 to 40 of the more common system gems including Rails 3, Rails 2, 3, 10, all that kind of stuff. So you can actually, you don't stub your toe on, on day one. But I just added something that I'm pretty sure the system doesn't have. And so when I say update R, it's actually going to go ahead and do everything that I'm telling it to do. It'll send it in. It tries to start it, and what immediately happens is the system prints out, and it's harder to see, um, that there's a startup log error that says, can't find HMAC SHA-1. So, if we put in a gem file that says, oh, my app needs Sinatra, Redis, and Ruby HMAC, require HMAC SHA-1. When we do this, now if I go and I say, okay, now update my app, it's going to pick up that gem file. I copied the gem file.lock so we couldn't all just sit here and watch uh, Ruby gems and Bundler go along. It's going to go ahead and says, oh, there's a pending thing, and it's trying to actually pull in uh, Ruby HMAC uh, 0.040. And this time it said it couldn't actually find it. It's trying to work on it and things like that. That experience is, it, it works. It kind of, it, it bubbles along, but bundle package. Remember in the presentation I said, that's, that's your friend. Put everything in there. Send us absolutely everything. Because if we've ever seen it anytime ever before, you actually won't physically upload it. Oh, that's not good. Mm. Sorry, I'll try to make this smaller so we can actually read it. I'll try it again. We'll see if it actually works. Nope, I must have typed something wrong in terms of the, uh, the require stuff. All right, we will move on since it's a live demo. Um, in terms of uh, the, the point was trying to be made, uh, which I failed at, but the point was trying to be made is, is that we give you a default set of system gems. Those will kind of be in flux, but we want to keep them small. Um, Sending us everything is the answer. So bundle package for Rails and Sinatra and things like that is, you know, is the answer. Um, so what about other stuff? Um, Pet Clinic is a downloadable jar file that runs Grails, which I would imagine not a lot of people here actually run. Um, but that WAR file actually comes directly from the internet. It uses a database, does some cool stuff in terms of putting together a web page. Um, remember the unnatural acts? I should be able to just say, go ahead and push this app. 
and I'll call it PC for pet clinic. Again, the further away you are from the court, it tries to be smarter, so it says, oh, I detected that you are a, a Grails app. Sorry, you can't see that, there we go. Um, do you want me to go ahead and do this? I'll go ahead and provision a database on the fly. We will auto bind that into the app. So for example, with the Redis example, I was doing things on my own, trying to pull the environment variables that described uh, uh, the service. But if we know what you want to do, we can actually do every, all the hard lifting for you. Uh, if you notice, it says uploaded application pet clinic, 8K. Pet clinic raw file is actually about 22 meg big. And it says that it started. And so now we have a trivial app, but getting more complex, that was simply downloaded from the Spring Grail site that now is running on vCloud Labs alongside of a Sinatra app. What about Rails 3? This was a Rails uh, new, put in a little hello from the cloud type stuff and a bundle package is the steps that we did. I'll call it R3. So again, you can see it says Rails application is detected. But once it actually gets to the execution point within the system, running on whichever uh, VM uh, that it's going to, it just sees a start and a stop button. So now this is uploading again. And so the bundle package is all that data is there. You're trying to quote unquote send everything into the cloud. But because of the finger fingerprinting stuff, you actually send very, very little. So we sent 5K of that app. Same thing, but now it's all Rails 3 actually vying to a database. Going back to the pet clinic, which I know everyone laughs at, but uh, one of the interesting things I wanted to show everyone is uh, if I do target, remember we talked about VMforce just a little bit? Essentially, I just said, take my working environment, what I'm familiar with, my tool set, simply take it from pointing here and point it over here. vCloud Labs is actually running inside a Terramark's facility in Miami. Salesforce is obviously on the west coast. So now all of a sudden I've just pointed my utility at totally, a totally different thing and said, okay, do the exact same thing I just did with this cloud, with this cloud. So I say, yep, sure, that sounds great. URL is obviously going to be different. Yes, yeah, sure, no problem. And if the network cooperates with us. So it's going to do the exact same thing it does with every single instantiation of the system. It's going to unpack everything that you have. It's going to fingerprint everything and send the manifest in. Whoever the cloud is, whatever the global resources are, it comes back and says, great. Have it, need it, have it, need it. We go ahead and send it. And now it says now it started on VMforce. So if now if I do. PC terminal. Now it's running on a totally different cloud. My experience was exactly the same. You have choice. We favor openness. And the last one I'll do is uh, I'll switch back to target to the cloud labs. Cloud Labs. DMC target. Ah, uh, lack of sleep. Perfect. This is a Node app. Who here ever has worked with Node or deployed a Node app? 
kind of cool. Non-blocking sometimes is frustrating, but it's neat in terms of how well it scales. Um, this is the app, which is again, kind of hard to see, but this one line right here of code is what we did to get it to run on uh, B Cloud Labs. This is very similar to what Heroku's done. In other words, just make the app so it doesn't assume what port it's gonna run, we'll pass you the port, don't worry about it. What's interesting though is, is that Node is one of the newer uh, frameworks on the scene, and already the ability to take this and deploy it into a system that is totally different than your laptop is one line of code. And so now if I actually do a VMC push, I'll call it chat. So it's actually running and we can do chat.bcloudlabs.com. And there's Ryan's uh, chat app. Again, we're gonna be taking sign up and interest. Please find Ezra. I know this talk had a lot of stuff in it and I think we lost a lot of people uh, uh, early on. Um, ping one of us if you wanna learn more. Please talk to some of us if you wanna have access to the system and get signed up for it. Um, and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Um, well, there's two pieces of that. Uh, one is a technical question and one is a business uh, question. The business question, I'm gonna kind of scoot and direct you over there to uh, the people that know that better than I do. Um, the technical question is, is though that, remember we talked about those inner and outer shells? The outer shell essentially takes a pool of resources. Now, what we currently don't do is we don't taint the resources based on what we wanna put where. We're trying to be very, you know, we just say, here's all the resources and we're just gonna place stuff as we, we, we need to in terms of, you know, we need more capacity. So for example, the inner shell has a lot of slack capacity on its own. So when you deploy an app, it feels like it's instant, even if you scale to 100 instances, that took like 11 seconds or something like that. That's because the inner shell actually has elasticity built into it where it has a capacity that it's actually running on. Underneath of it, the, the Bosch, uh, which is what we call our outer shell, it understands the impedance mismatch between what the inner shell thinks its capacity is and as it gets high, closer to that high water mark and what it actually has. And so then it actually says, oh, you're getting close to your capacity, I'm actually gonna start spinning up my own capacity. And that's in the, uh, the, uh, the way that happens is, is spinning up VMs, cloning VMs and spinning them up. And remember we talked about them being stem cells. And then if it's, you need more app capacity, we shoot a message saying this is what you're gonna be. And so, the system is designed from the ground up to at least achieve this concept of, as a user, you feel like you have endless capacity. It just keeps coming and it's free and it's, it's, it's easy. I mean, the kick the tires, hello world app of, of the cloud is, push it, wow, that looks great. Spin it up to 100 instances. And it's hard to do that on a lot of different systems. Um, so we try to do that. Now, of course, there's also the fail out of Bosch says, he's full, I'm full, somebody's gotta order more hardware, right? And so that's the, that's the, the end of the game, so to speak. Yes. Uh, what do you advise to the never store a central state and then the demo or migrate one to the MNS features? Like sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the, the, the big thing there is essentially is, is that the rules that are being defined for the system itself might not necessarily apply to your app. So the services that were showing up there were for app consumption. So apps can store that. And what happens at that point is, is with an ecosystem of service providers, is that you can provide the MySQL instance that has disaster recovery or high availability or hourly snapshots or things like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's this balance of not making your app do unnatural things and having the system do the right things for you. But when I said no central state, I was actually talking about the, the PaaS system itself in terms of. Any more?
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's actually uh, put into the system now. There's two different ways you can do that. One is you can actually do an update, and an update will actually start a canary, uh, and it'll make sure that the canary's okay, and it'll actually swip, you know, swap things. The other one that we talked a lot about last night in the meetup is if I make a change, for the demo, it's fine for me to just say, update my app. I think I know what I'm doing. Obviously, I, I don't all the time, but I, you know, I think I do. In production, you wouldn't do that. But it'd be nice if you just said, push this app and put it under new app dot internal uh, dot test dot, you know, vcloudlabs.com, which is VPNable and only accessible inside the company. And you look at it and you play with it and you say, oh, okay, it's great. And what I did in demo was is that you can then just say, map the URL, swip them, you know, and you will guarantee to never drop a request. So you can say, okay, it looks great, and you flip it. The other thing, too, is, is you can obviously run lots of instances. And so the router knows it has lots of choices to actually deliver your request. We were only running one instance in that, that demo when I was bouncing it up and down. Yes? Yeah, um, that's a good question. The question was, is, is what are you thinking about around CI development and, uh, or CI systems in terms of if this looks like a black box? Um, the short answer is, is that we've actually thought a lot about it. We've actually manifested something called Code the Cloud, which we're still working through, which has the concepts of test frameworks and staging frameworks and continuous integration and bug reporting, all kind of in conjunction with a system like this. Um, and so we're, we're working pretty hard on what that feels like and what that looks like. The short answer is, is that even though AppCloud is a black box, uh, I mean, uh, the system is a black box, um, you know, we do have the concept of these utility VMs, so we understand that there's going to be needs that aren't met by, uh, oh, you just worry about your application and its associative services. Any others? Thank you.